I'll be back in a few.
Hi, Sophia. Hi, everybody. Good evening to those of you who have joined us. We'll be getting started in just a few minutes. As you wait, we are making tonight's presentation available in English and Spanish. And so we do ask that you go to the bottom ledger on Zoom and select the globe icon to select your language preference as either English or Spanish. Again, we'll wait for a few more to join us and we'll be getting started shortly after seven o'clock. Okay, good evening, Ventura. 
We have people joining us now. Before we get started tonight, I want to remind everyone that tonight's presentation will be available in English and in Spanish. We ask that every attendee select their language preference as either English or Spanish. You can do this by going to the Zoom toolbar and selecting the icon that looks like a little globe. And we do ask that you either select English or Spanish for your preferred language preference for tonight's presentation. We'll be getting started in just one minute. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us tonight for tonight's virtual community open house to discuss the proposed water and wastewater rate adjustments. My name is Haley Matsukawa and I will be your moderator tonight. As I've mentioned before, tonight's presentation is available in both English and in Spanish. And we ask that all guests select their language preference. You can do this by going to the Zoom toolbar and you'll see an icon that looks like a little globe. If you select that, we ask that you either select English or Spanish for your preferred language preference. Um, our Spanish speakers will also have an opportunity to submit questions tonight. And our interpreter, Carlos, will be supporting us um, moving through our presentation in Spanish and then both supporting our Spanish speakers during the Q&A session. So tonight we will begin with a short greeting from our special guest, Mayor Ruba Calva. We will also um, have a short brief presentation to discuss the proposed water and wastewater rates, followed by a question and answer session. So we have plenty of time tonight to answer all the public's questions. Um, we hope you came prepared with questions and you can submit those at any time during tonight's presentation. So once we get to the Spanish portion of our presentation, um, you have two options. Guests can come on camera and share their question live with our panelists, or if you're not interested in coming on camera, you have the option to just submit your question in writing, and I will present that question to our panelists. So all of tonight's questions will be submitted through the Q&A feature on the Zoom toolbar. So we'll be using the Q&A feature and at any time tonight, you can submit your question in both English and in Spanish using the Q&A feature. If you would like to present your question live, we just ask that you include the word live with your question and we'll be sure to promote you and turn on your camera so you can present your question to our panel directly. As I mentioned, alternatively, feel free to submit your question in writing. And before we get started, I do wanna to introduce tonight's panel. Uh, we have a panel of experts who have joined us to help support your questions. We have a, with us tonight, we have Assistant City Manager, Akbar Ali Khan. We have Ventura Water General Manager, Susan Rungren. We have one of our water commissioners, Suzanne McCombs, joining us tonight. We have Assistant City Attorney, Miles Hogan. Assistant General Manager of Operations, Gina Dorrington. Assistant General Manager of Water Resources, Betsy Cooper. And then lastly, our translator, Carlos, will be supporting us tonight. So I see a few more just joined. If you're just joining us tonight, please use the toolbar to select your language preference. You click the little globe and we ask that you select either English or Spanish. And then again, we'll be using the Q&A feature tonight to address our questions. And if you're interested in coming on camera and presenting your question directly to our panel, we ask that you use the word live. So without further ado, I would like to introduce City of Ventura Mayor, Ruba Calva. Thank you very much, Haley. Uh, good evening, everybody. I just wanna thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us tonight to learn more about Ventura's plan to fund and finance critical water and wastewater infrastructure and maintain our water and wastewater services. As many of you know, the city's water and wastewater systems are currently facing many challenges and we need responsible investment now in order to replace and repair our aging infrastructure. We need to meet regulatory, environmental and legal requirements. 
We need to improve water quality and we need to meet existing and future water supply needs. So I would like to thank the Water Commission, city staff and our financial consultants who in the last year have invested many hours and hosted many late night meetings in order to ensure fair and equitable rates for all customers and to generate sufficient revenue to meet operating and capital costs. So we know that these are difficult decisions that require careful consideration. And so with that, I would just like to thank all of you, all of the community members who are here in attendance this evening and your input is valued and we are glad you are here. So as a community, I know that we will continue to come together to ensure a sustainable water future for Ventura that's clean, safe, and reliable. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor. I'm gonna be turning it over to Assistant City Manager Akbar Alaykon and Ventura Water General Manager Susan Rungren, who has a short presentation just to cover some of the policy decisions and the water and wastewater rate recommendations. All right. All right, so I'll go ahead and start out. Um, good evening and welcome to the community open house on the city's proposed water and wastewater rates. Again, as the Madam Mayor um, uh, remarked, we're really happy to have you here tonight. We want your input. Um, and so we'll go ahead and get started. Next slide, please. The agenda tonight, where I'm gonna first talk a little bit about why water rate, water and wastewater rates adjustments are needed now. And then the water commissioner, Suzanne McCombs, is going to talk about the rate study process, what we've been through this last year with our rate consultants and with the water commission. And then assistant city manager, Akbar Ali Khan, is going to talk about the key policy decisions and some of the customer impacts, give you some examples. And then I'll make some closing statements. Next slide. Next slide, please. So a little background on Ventura Water. Who is Ventura Water? We have a staff of 100 plus. We do water, wastewater, and recycled water. We have three water treatment plants, one wastewater treatment plant, several miles of pipelines, pump stations, lift stations for the sewer system. Um, we have dedicated staff. And one of the things that you might see capital improvement programs, ongoing construction in the streets, but what you don't see is behind the scenes, the admin staff, the customer care, water billing staff, the um, full service lab for water and wastewater, our operators and many field personnel also. It takes really a dedicated team to ensure that we have limited interruption in our water and wastewater services. Next slide. So one of the things that we've done is we do a multi-step process when we do a, a rate study we usually do a rate study about every five years. We have not done one since the Thomas fire of 2017 due to obviously critical and priority needs at that time. And what we start out with first of all is a system needs evaluation. We look at the water and wastewater infrastructure. What are our needs? What are our future water supply uh, demands? And uh, what water quality impacts are being met with our regulatory requirements? We have changing conditions, financing that we need to look at. So we work with our different departments, our finance and technology department, um, with our public works department to look at what are the critical projects identified. And in this rate study, we're looking at 36 water and wastewater projects from pipelines to treatment plant improvements to new facilities and wells. So again, I mentioned the rate study, and this is something that Water Commission has been working on again this past year with our finances financial advisors, as well as different city departments. And they have made a recommendation to council for the rate approval. And I'll talk a little bit about the schedule later on. So why is responsible investment needed now? As many of you know, it's an old city is an older city. We have aging infrastructure. We have regulatory environmental and legal requirements and mandates. We have water quality improvements that are needed throughout the city to meet regulatory requirements. And we have existing and future water supply needs. Next slide. So a little bit about our current water supply. 
Many of you might know that we have several sources, which is a good thing, but they are, they are basically rain dependent water sources. So we have Lake Casitas, which is down to one of its lowest levels ever due to the recent drought. We have Ventura River, which we have uh, litigation on right now. We're not able to use as much as, as we can, obviously due to drought also. We have three different groundwater basins and all those groundwater basins have new regulatory requirements, something called the Groundwater Sustainability Act. These agencies are formed and then we're, doing, we're working on plans right now through these um, agencies. And we know that with, with what's coming out of these are new allocations. For instance, the Oxnard Plain Basin, we anticipate losing uh, up to 50% of our allocation. Next slide. So when we look at our capital improvement projects, we know right now we have wastewater facility upgrades at the wastewater treatment plant, which again is, is aging and very old. We have regulatory compliance and we're re replacing aging infrastructure there. We have what's called our east to west waterline interconnects. This is helping us to bring water supply from east to west throughout the city. State water uh, interconnect project and the Ventura Water Pier program, which I'll talk about in the next couple of slides. Next slide, please. So the state water interconnect project, this is gonna give us the ability to utilize our state water project water we've had since the early seventies. This project is a regional project in that Cayugas Municipal Water District, United Water Conservation District and Casitas Municipal Water District are going in with us. It's now in the permitting design. It's gonna give us regional um, emergency supplies and it's gonna be able to help with our water quality in the east side of Ventura and really to secure water supply sources, a water supply source when our other sources are drought dependent. Because as some of you may notice, sometimes the state water project or Northern California may get substantial rain. Here in Southern California, we may not. So we're actually able to bring more water in from our state water project at times when we have drought here. Next slide. Another project you may have heard about is the Ventura Water Pier Program. What we're doing here is we bring wastewater into the Ventura Water Reclamation Facility that exists now. What we're looking to do is do an advanced water purification facility. This will purify the water and then be injected into the groundwater basin. We'll extract it during times of need and then take it to another treatment facility and blend with our existing sources. This is gonna help us with our water quality and provide future supply that's really a drought resilient source. It's gonna meet also some legal mandates. We are required to no longer discharge to the estuary. This is happening all over the state. There was actually uh, something on the news today with LA City talking about reusing all their wastewater. Um, and so one of the things that gives us also is water supply for the future. It eliminates also needed facility upgrades to our existing treatment plants that would require um, ex uh, more treatment. So this is gonna give us some blending water. Uh, a lot of people say, or we've heard a lot of people thinking that the rates are going up because of Ventura Water Pier. There is a portion of the rates that will go up because any project, any operation and maintenance that we do and any new projects obviously cost money, but it's not just Ventura Water Pier. Again, it's the annual operation and maintenance of our system and it's any new capital improvement projects, which, in, which includes several different projects. Next slide. So some of the things we, we obviously look at is funding. What can we do to help out our ratepayers for funding? We just, we were awarded um, last year, a $2.4 million recycled water grant from the Bureau of Reclamation. And we just made an application for more monies. We're hoping to get up to $20 million for that grant. We also, our finance and technology department uh, worked with us as well as other city departments and they saved $16 million by bond refinancing, which was a really great thing. They're actually doing the same thing for the general fund. Um, and then we also have what's called the Water Infrastructure Finance Innovation Act loan. So this is something we applied for and we're gonna get up to $125 million low interest loan. Next slide. And now I'll turn this over to Suzanne McCombs to talk about our rate study process. Good evening. 
One of the key responsibility of the Water Commission is to provide policy guidance for sustainable long-term financial plans that support safe and reliable water and wastewater services for our residents and business community. Rates need to be sufficient to generate revenues that will cover operations and maintenance needs, fund debt payment and capital improvements, as well as remaining fair, equitable, and affordable for all customers. Developing rates is a very technical and challenging process. We prioritized four objectives in our analysis, affordability, customer understanding, financial stability, and defensibility. Ventura Water also developed a rate engagement webpage, which included multiple means for customers to gain information and share input and values. And public input from that staff outreach was a key component considered by the Water Commission. Next slide, please. Over the past year, Water Commission met more than eight times on this topic. We extensively reviewed and evaluated the data provided by city staff and the financial consultant. In January, we approved moving forward with a five-year rate schedule, including a required annual rate check-in to be conducted each spring of the study period to authorize the rate adjustment necessary for the upcoming July increase. Given the magnitude of the capital projects that are included within the study period, a key component to the Water Commission's approval of the proposed rate structure was the requirement that staff from both Public Works and Ventura Water provide an annual check-in to the Water Commission in each spring to evaluate progress on the various capital projects to determine if the full rate increase is required each year. Now I'm going to hand the presentation over to Ak Assistant City Manager Akbar Ali Khan to further discuss customer impacts. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. Next slide. I want to orient the audience here of what's in front of you. Uh, this is a comparison of Ventura to its peer agencies throughout the county on how we stack up for water and wastewater rates. Uh, these numbers here are shown in monthly terms for a couple of reasons. One is just because of the pure uh, sake of comparison to our other neighboring agencies. The other one is we have a uh, plan to transition to monthly billing starting in July of this year. The one thing that's uh, I'm hoping readily apparent just by looking at the graphic is Ventura trends lower than most of our peer agencies on screen. In fact, we're third from the bottom of the list here. Uh, and this is for a, the average Ventura household using nine HCF per month. And you'll see this term HCF throughout the presentation. It stands for 100 cubic feet. And if you were to look at your bill, you would see a, a similar acronym on that too. It's essentially the billing uh, unit of measurement that we use industry-wide. It's 748 gallons uh, or roughly uh, nine HCF is about, uh, I'm sorry, 748 gallons is about a 10 minute shower every day for, for a month. So taking that average household using nine HCF per month, uh, paying $90 a month today in the city of Ventura, that same household would pay $103 in the city of Oxnard just by way of comparison. Let's go to, the, go to the next slide. This is the big takeaway from tonight um, is the, the proposed adjustments uh, as part of this rate study. Uh, the proposal is for water service to increase by 7% each year for the next five years and wastewater service to increase by 6% each year for the next five years. So going back to that average Ventura household paying about $90 today uh, that family would see their bill increase by $7.76 a month uh, on average, and that would go up by uh, another $7.76 each July uh, over the course of the five-year planning period. And if that sounds a little bit confusing, I, let me demonstrate that on the next slide, please. So again, that average entire household today is all the way to the left there, paying, again, 90 bucks a month. And each July, uh, their bill would go up uh, and if you use less than nine HCF, that change would be less. If you use more than nine HCF, that change may be higher. So just as an example, using the, that average uh, single family household in Ventura, uh, today they're paying $90. Uh, come July, they'd pay $100. And you might be saying, well, from 90 to 100, that's 10. That's more than the 776. And you'd be right. The 776 is an average. And that's demonstrated as we go one more year from July of 2021 to July of 2022, it goes up by six and a half dollars. So again, some are higher, some are lower, but over the arc of five years, it's an average of $7.76. And 
And then at the end of five years, that same household would pay $128.72. Keep that number in mind as we flip to the next slide, please. So this shows uh, where Ventura would stack up against its peer agencies in the year 2025 at the end of the planning period. And what you'll see is we are kind of smack dab in the middle. We have about six agencies to our left, about six agencies to our right. And uh, even despite some of these rather significant increases for Ventura residents, we are still competitive with a lot of our peer agencies. And what we're getting for that $128 a month is this drought proof water supply uh, in the way of Ventura Water Pure that Susan talked about. So it's not just raising rates to uh, have the same assets that we have today. It's for uh, improved assets uh, and better water quality in the not too distant future. Next slide. So aside from residential impacts, uh, we'll also see impacts to other different customer classes. I'm gonna show you three examples quickly. Uh, in the lower left-hand corner, I take for example, a small retail boutique clothing store uh, that's a uh, thousand square feet using four HCF per month. Today, that business pays $77. Their bill would go up by an average of $5.69 per month. Uh, the middle column there, this is a uh, multifamily residential apartment building with uh, 10 apartments in it using 40 HCF per month. That building collectively pays $457 today. Their bill on average would go up by $26 per month. And the last example, all the way to the right, uh, take a restaurant uh, using 1,500, I'm sorry, a 1,500 square foot restaurant using 40 HCF per month. Uh, today, that restaurant would pay about $600 a month for both water and wastewater. Their bill on average would go up by $27. Next slide. If you're at all wondering what the proposed increases may mean for you and your household, you can actually go to the website we have set up dedicated just to this topic. We try to make it easy to remember. It's Ventura waterrates.net. Again, VenturaWaterRates.net. You can go there and up there we have a water bill calculator. It's a really handy tool. I encourage you to, to try it out for yourself. Just type in uh, what customer type you are, your meter size, and uh, your bi-monthly and winter bi-monthly usage. It'll actually tell you what your current bill comes out to and what your uh, bill would be come July under the proposed rate adjustments. If you're unsure about what to use, uh, what to select in those drop-down menus, and you need some help, uh, please don't hesitate to call our customer care line during business hours. That number is 667-6500. Next slide. In addition to rate changes, there will also be some uh, changes to the bill as it's seen on, on paper. One is that we are changing from uh, bi-monthly to a monthly billing cycle, as I mentioned. The other is just some cosmetic changes to make it a bit easier to read and understand. And lastly, we are uh, getting rid of this thing called the estuary protection charge as a line item on the bill. The revenue collected from the estuary protection charge has been rolled into the, the regular sewer charge, but as a line item that will no longer appear on the bill. Next slide. So I'll get into key policy decisions now. And this is probably the most impactful policy decision that the Water Commission uh, recommended to the City Council. And there's three data points I want to uh, point out. Uh, one is just the sheer number of tiers. So that's probably the most apparent one. Uh, up above, just to orient the audience here, uh, we have our current tier structure. And this only applies for residential users, not, not commercial or anyone like that, just for residential. Up above, we have our current tier structure. And you'll first thing you'll notice is that there's four tiers that we have today. Whereas under the proposed tier structure, uh, that's been proposed to go down to three tiers. The second thing I want to point out is just the cost for tier one. Under the current tier structure, uh, that tier one cost is $2.77. And under the proposed, it's going up by nominal 15 cents to $2.92. Uh, that really is quite a, a small jump, particularly when you contrast that with maybe these other tiers on the screen. Take, for example, uh, tier two, going from $3.12 to $4.80, that's more than a $1.50 increase. Uh, so again, tier one, uh, Water Commission's goal was to keep 
uh, water as efficient or, or as affordable as possible for low income and fixed income residents. Uh, this is one of the ways they did that. The other way they did that is take a look at the tier width. And it's in small numbers there, but below where it says tier one, you'll see uh, the number zero to three HCF. What that means is for your first, second and third unit of water, you're gonna pay $2.77. But for your fourth unit of water, you're gonna pay that $3.12 rate. And then compare that down below to the proposed structure. See that zero to three, it's been doubled from zero to six. And so what that means is for your first six units, you're paying that nice low rate of $2.92. It's not until your seventh unit of water that you're paying the higher price of $4.81. Next slide. So just to get an idea of what today's uh, four tier structure and how uh, our residents uh, fall into the different tiers. Uh, today, we have a, a group of residents who stay within tier one, which is, is difficult to do. Three HCF is about 2,100 gallons. It sounds like a lot, but it really isn't. Uh, it's difficult to do, which is why only 21% of our residents uh, are able to stay within it. Most of us end up in that tier two and tier three category and a handful of us end up in tier four. Keep the 21% in mind as we flip to this next slide. Um, that has gone from 21% to 51%. And that's really powerful. It, going from 0 to 3 HCF to 0 to 6 HCF, just doubling that tier width for tier one, 51% of our residents are able to stay within that now. In other words, more than half of them will stay in tier one without ever paying that tier two price. And again, kudos to the Water Commission for that recommendation. Um, that will be, uh, I know, welcome news for uh, uh, some efficient users of our water system. Next slide. I'm going to hand it back to Susan now to wrap it up. Thank you, Akbar. So as many of you um, might have received in the mail, uh, Prop 218 public notice. Um, as we talked about tonight earlier, we have been going through this um, financial analysis with our rate consultants, as well as the Water Commission. We went to city council on March 22nd. At that time, um, they received the water commission recommendation to approve the proposed five-year water and wastewater base rates and water shortage rates as maximum potential increases. And then they approved us to go ahead and um, send out the public notice. So um, the next steps here are, we've done several presentations um, before March 22nd, um, I think we had around 20 to 22 council, uh, community council meetings. We went to the Chamber of Commerce, Rotary Club. Um, and so now here we are on April 28th at the second community open house. We will then be going to city council for the public hearing on May 17th. And if approved, we will implement new rates beginning July. Next slide. So again, why is responsible investment needed now? As I mentioned before, we have aging infrastructure. If we do not have the rates to support, we will have failing infrastructure, more costly repairs and compliance issues. And as far as regulatory requirements, we would not be able to meet those and we would have legal fines and fees and we have legal mandates to meet. We also need to improve our water quality. So we would have extensive upgrades to existing facilities. And with water supply needs, not just for existing, but future customers, we could have higher future rates, meaning we'd have to find other water supply sources. And with Ventura Water Pier, we're able to have an actual drought proof source. We could have economic fallout and a potential build-in moratorium. Next slide. And so tonight, we hope you um, got information from our presentation and we're here to answer any questions for you. And I'll turn it back to Haley. Thank you, Susan, Suzanne, and Akbar. Um, again, here's a panel who is available to help support the public in questions. Um, in a minute, I will be closing out the presentation and the rest of the night is really just dedicated to answering um, the public's questions. Um, as a reminder, you guys have two options to submit questions. Um, you can submit your question live if you'd like to come on camera and speak directly with our panel. If you would like to do that, we just ask that you include the word live with your question. 
and we'll be sure to promote you so you can address our panel directly. If you're not interested in coming on camera, um, no pressure. You can go ahead and submit your question in the Q&A feature in Zoom, and I will be sure to present your question to the panel. So with that, um, I'm going to open it up to the public. We received a few questions beforehand, and so we'll start with those. And at any time tonight, you are welcome to submit your question in English or in Spanish. And again, include the word live with your question if you would like to speak directly with our panel. All right, thank you. Okay, we will go ahead and get started. I see that I, we already have received a few great questions from the public. Our first question is, where is the state water the city has had rights to, and where will the seven mile pipeline be built? So, Susan, would you like to go ahead and address this question? And you can also welcome our assistant general manager, Betsy Cooper, who has been overseeing the project. Susan, we'll start with you. Sure, um, I can answer the first part and I'll have Betsy talk about the location of the, of the State Water Interconnect project. So the city's had a state water allocation of 10,000 acre feet per year since the early 70s. And so this is a, a way that we're able to actually um, implement and get that water here. So Betsy, go ahead for the second part. I think you're not on speaker. Betsy, we can come back to you if you're having trouble with your audio. The second part of the question where was where will the seven mile pipeline be built? And Betsy, as we're waiting for you to get your audio sorted out, we have resources on Ventura Water's website that has a detailed map of the proposed alignment for the seven mile pipeline that will essentially connect to um, Cayugas Municipal Water District's distribution system in Camarillo and um, on the connect to Ventura on the east end. Again, there's more details on the website and we'll come back to this as Betsy sorts out her audio. So the second question is, how many new residential and commercial units are being built and proposed to be built? Um, can they not offset the cost of water and wastewater service without affecting our existing residents? So it's a great question and Akbar, I will go ahead and have you respond to that. Sure, uh, I'll do my best. Um... I don't have offhand the number of new residential units or new commercial units that are currently under construction or slated to be built. Uh, what I, maybe a data point I can share is uh, we do have a state mandate called uh, RHNA, R-H-N-A, Regional Housing Needs Allocation. Uh, what that is is a mandate from the state to zone for, not construct, but zone for a certain number of housing units in response to the, the state housing crisis. And so uh, the number that the city of Ventura has been given is 5,200 for this RENA cycle. Um, so we will see uh, some zoning for additional housing in our city. Uh, is, what was the second half of the question? I know it was a two-parter. Yeah, so the second half of the question is um, can the buildings not offset the cost of water and wastewater services for our existing residents? That's a good question. Uh, the short answer is they, they are paying for their share of our water systems costs and our existing residents are paying for their share of their cost on our water system. In other words, new developments is not being subsidized by existing ratepayers. Existing ratepayers are not being subsidized by new development. Okay, great. And Afar, I actually think you answered one of our next question, which is why not a building moratorium now here in the city of Ventura? Right. I, the, the RENA state mandate is, I think, a part of that story. Uh, the other piece uh, of relevant news is uh, we avoided a building moratorium uh, in large part due to the 2016 uh, net zero and water rights dedication ordinance that the city council passed. Um, new development has to pay either, either to one of two things. Either they have to pay a net zero fee, which is quite substantial. It's $27,000 per acre foot or roughly $10,000 per housing unit. Uh, either they have to do that or they have to dedicate water rights to the city as part of their development. And we saw this recently 
uh, on the east end of town, for those of you familiar with the Parklands project uh, out there off Wells Road, uh, that project uh, just recently dedicated 85 acre feet to the city uh, for their future phases of the Parklands development. So again, new development has to do one of those two things uh, for new housing units to get constructed. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we have a question that's come in in regards to a water shortage. So the question is, since we are already in a stage two drought, where will the income from those additional charges be allocated? So Susan, maybe you wanna to speak to um, how our water shortage will be impacted beginning July 1, should these rates be implemented? Yeah, so one of the things we're looking at is really our, we're in a stage two right now, but with our new rates, it's really the new normal of water conservation. So people have done a really good job of water conservation. Um, and so our base demands are really staying about the same. So what we anticipate is we're gonna be coming out of that stage two drought. Um, during drought, I think one of the questions he might be ask, asking is, what do we do with those additional charges? Those are used for conservation programs to really help people um, use less water. Okay, great. Thank you, Susan. We have more questions coming in. I just want to remind the audience, if you're interested in directing your question to our panel, um, just include the word live and we will pull you up on camera, but I'm happy to take your questions um, over the Q&A feature as well. So we have another question. Will these capital improvements be paid off over the next five years? or are we anticipating higher rates to continue beyond 2025? So Akbar, I'll go ahead and have you address that. Sure. Uh, the short answer is no, uh, we will not pay off the capital improvements uh, over the next five years. Uh, Susan made mention of a, a, a WIFI loan and uh, I, for, I forget what the acronym stands for, I'll admit. Uh, but WIFIA is a federal program where we get low interest loans. Uh, we're talking somewhere on the order of a 2% interest rate, uh, which is much better than we could get on the open bond market. Uh, those loans traditionally last somewhere between 30 and 40 years, so almost for the life of the asset. And uh, most agencies like us, and in fact, nearly all of them, uh, finance large capital investments via debt. That is the common practice, in fact, the appropriate practice. And so um, now we will, we will issue debt to pay for a, a large chunk of these capital improvements. Another chunk will be through grants and another chunk will be through cash on hand or reserves in the bank. As far as the second piece of the question, uh, do we expect higher rates uh, beyond 2025? Uh, we will expect to see rate adjustments beyond 25, 2025, yes. Is it gonna be on the order of what we're proposing today? Uh, perhaps not because we're really going through and playing a little bit of catch up uh, based on uh, three years of not having touched rates as Susan mentioned since the Thomas fire. Thank you, Akbar. Um, another question we have is what is being done about capturing runoff um, that is currently runs down the storm drains and into the ocean. So I don't know who's best to answer this, but Susan, if you wanna address this question, I know this is a responsibility of our public works department, but you can um, speak on behalf of, of your knowledge of the issue. Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you, Haley. Yeah, so one of the things that's been talked about regionally for quite some time is, is capturing stormwater runoff. Part of the issue is though, when we have high flows, we also have high flows at the wastewater plant um, just due to some infiltration. So um, where to capture that and where to store that is a question. That is something though that the, again, regionally the county um, has some jurisdiction over. And again, our public works department is working on that. So that is something that um, people look at rain barrels for their own homes. So there is um, some good things you can do on site and we do have some information on our, on our website um, that talks about that, but there will definitely be more talk about that in the future. Thank you, Susan. Uh, we have another question about affordability and how are these rates going to be able to provide affordable water and wastewater services for our low income um, residents? So Akbar, if you wanna to speak to that, please. Sure. I think there's a couple points worth mentioning. Uh, 
the slider we showed the two tier comparison, I think that really drives home the point. Expanding tier one water from zero to three units to zero to six units is tremendously impactful if you are a low water user. Uh, particularly if you're kind of on that cusp of, you know, three, four, five units every month, you are now going to be exclusively in tier one, assuming you use the same amount of water. Uh, and that was, as I said in the presentation, one of the key goals for the Water Commission is really to make sure that those low income and fixed income residents are able to have affordable water service. In addition to that, we do have a uh, low income rate repair assistance program. Um, you can apply through that. Again, call our customer service line, the 667-6500. If you qualify for Edison's program, as an example, uh, we use the same eligibility criteria and you can use that as a basis for qualifying for ours. And again, we do have a limited capacity on that. Um, Haley, I don't know if you know the number of spots available, but um, I know it comes on a first come, first come, first come, first served basis. Thank you, Akbar. Yeah, that's correct. Last time I checked, there was about um, 80 spots open for that program, which is um, the most we've had in quite a while. So if you or your neighbors um, qualify that for that program and need assistance covering your water and wastewater bill, um, our customer care can help you get signed up for that program. Um, I'm gonna take a minute to check in with our translator, Carlos, to see if we have received any questions from our Spanish speakers. And with that, I welcome the audience to include your questions in the Q&A feature and include the word live if you'd like to do to speak with our panel directly. Carlos, are you available? Thank you very much, Carlos. Okay, I have one question that we received um, earlier this week that I want to address tonight. Um, this is in regards to the changes that are coming to our wastewater bill, the wastewater portion of our bill. I know we've talked a lot about the water portion of our bill tonight. And the first question is, you know, how does the city meter or measure our wastewater and how are those costs um, accounted for in our wastewater portion of our bill? Should I go ahead with that one, Haley? Yes, please, thank you. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, today we use something called a uh, sewer determination period. And we take a look at the months of February to April. It may vary slightly depending on your, your exact billing cycle. And we take a look at how much water uh, did you consume during those three months. And that becomes the proxy for what you're charged for sewer for the remainder of the year. The logic there being that uh, because they're, because those are the wetter months um, and your outdoor needs are generally met by precipitation, uh, everything that passes through your meter during those three months must really be for indoor usage. Therefore, your indoor usage is water that's ending up in the sewer system. Um, that, is, that is the way it's currently done. It's the best that we were able to do up until now uh, because we had limitations with our billing system and also uh, we had limitations with our metering system, but now we have a new billing system. We have a new uh, advanced metering system where we can actually uh, get uh, reads more frequently on water use. And so what we're moving towards is actually billing for sewer charges that are based on monthly water use instead of, and that'll actually move with you throughout the year rather than just using this three month period as a proxy. Um, yeah, there's there's benefits to to this approach. Um, you know, the, the Ventura seasons vary, and so uh, this the old model, the current model, I should say, made an assumption that customers' water use was minimal during those, uh, or it was minimal outdoor usage during those winter months. That was not always the case. I mean, just this year is a good example. We had a pretty dry February and March, and I imagine uh, some of those on the line listening probably used uh, some water outdoors. Uh, also, if you experience a, a leak under the current uh, methodology or fill your pool or have more people in the house uh, during that three month period, you will pay for that through the remainder of the year. Um, so again, moving to a true water usage model uh, doesn't penalize you for using a lot of water during those three months. And uh, the other thing I think that's worth mentioning is 
if you do have a garden at home uh, or you're a green thumb, uh, you can keep in mind you do have a cap. So anything above 12 HCF, uh, you will not be charged a sewer charge for that. That is the cap for single family residential users. Thank you, Akbar. Um, okay, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and we have a question that's come in regarding water quality. Um, the question is, will any of this improve the mineral content of the water that affects our water heater with sediment buildup and corrosive pipes and fixtures that cause many of us to buy um, bottled water or install a water softener? So Susan, do you wanna speak on behalf of how rates will improve water quality? Sure, and the short answer is yes. Um, and the reason being, we again, we talked about state water interconnection and that's coming into the east side of the city. The advanced water purification facility will really treat water and be able to be blended with water kind of in the midtown area, if you will. So one of the things we're also working on right now is the water master plan. And that has um, what we're calling a water quality modeling in it. Um, the state water project also has a blending station. So we are looking into the water quality throughout the city to help with that. Okay, great. Thanks, Susan. Um, we have one attendee, Al, who would like to address the panel. He has quite a few questions. So Al, we'll just take one question at a time. Um, but we're going to go ahead and promote you, Al, if you want to turn on your camera and your audio. Al's first question is regarding the estuary fee. So Akbar, maybe you'll have a chance to address this. Al, as we promote you, um, let's go ahead and start with your question for the estuary fee, and then we can move on to your question regarding water conservation shortly after that. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, if you could kind of uh, cue me on the uh, series of questions I asked, I don't see my uh, Q&A coming up on my screen. So uh, yeah, we'll start off with the estuary program. I guess I'm concerned that um, there's a little smoke and mirrors going on with the rolling of the estuary fee into the base fee. Um, it's my understanding that we as ratepayers are paying to dump potable water into the estuary to maintain the ecosystem in that area of the Santa Clara River. Um, is that indeed the case? It's not potable water. And really Susan's kind of the expert if, if she's, <laughs> if there's anything worth clarifying, Susan, please do. Sure, um, yeah. So I think kind of starting a little bit backwards here. So one of the things the city does is we um, discharge to the estuary and we are not allowed to discharge to the estuary anymore. So one of the things that we've done is the estuary protection fee helps us to monitor, to do studies, to study how much can we actually take out of the estuary because we also have potential habitat there. So we've done studies over the last several years since around 2008 to determine how much water can we reuse and treat. And so the estuary fee was really helping with the monitoring and the preliminary reports to get us here. Now that we have a project Ventura Water Peer Program we are going to now use that what that monies are going into our wastewater and water fee to help pay for cleaning up the water even better to be able to provide it to actually as a water supply source. So we don't need that separate fee anymore. It's really just part of the water and wastewater rates. Well, okay. So my understanding was that the, um, the effluent from the uh, water, the advanced water purification plant is going to be re-injected or injected into the aquifer. Is that true? Correct. Okay, so um, by virtue of doing that, we have natural purification and filtration occurring in the groundwater aquifer. So um, I guess I'm wondering what in particular is that advanced water purification plant uh, providing for us as rate payers? What, what are we paying for there? So we already treat the wastewater. We have to advance, treat the wastewater to basically inject it into the groundwater basin. There are regulatory requirements that actually make you uh, have a certain water quality to get it into the groundwater basin. And then you have to model that to see how long of a, 
uh, time retention it takes and you can bring it back up and then we actually have to retreat that. And that is what is required. Okay, and, and are the, um, I guess the potential co contaminants are by the treatment, I'm uh, concluding that we have to um, remove contaminants. Are those uh, heavy metals? Is it uh, sodium chloride from our water uh, softeners, uh, you know, concentrating a sodium solution into our waste stream? W what is it in particular? So I'll hand it over now to Gina Dorrington, who's our um, assistant general manager of operations, and she can kind of explain more in detail. She's been very in depth into this. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for your question. Um, the um, Susan mentioned before the regulations to use um, our effluent as a um, source into the groundwater require us to have a multi barrier process. So this is to remove any sort of constituents of concern that would be potentially in that water. So um, we'll have several layers of filtration and oxidation in the process that make the water ultimately pure um, and destroy any sort of um, emerging constituents, uh, pharmaceuticals, those things that are of concern. And the process by that also does remove um, metal ions and high salts. So we will um, receive a very pure form of H2O that will be then injected into the groundwater basin. So then that uh, goes to address the previous question about the um, potential uh, diminishing liability on the part of the ratepayers for the exceedingly hard water that we now are supplied with. Is that, is that true? Or by injecting the purified water into the groundwater, does that purified water then pick up the dissolved solids, you know, the calciums, the phosphates, et cetera, um, or the, the, the sodiums, get, that gets drawn up out of the well. And so there again, we're, we have hard water coming to our taps. This water, along with state water, will be blended um, to help improve water quality, both in the groundwater basin and within the system that exists now. So we do anticipate that we will see an improvement in water quality. You are right, um, because of its H2O capacity um, being pure, there are potentials to pick up naturally occurring sediments in the, in the uh, aquifer, and that will involve some um, conditioning on our part to keep that water stable and prevent that from happening. So the anticipation is overall, the water quality will improve with these sources of water. With the additional conditioning being uh, paid for by the ratepayers. It's part of the process. Right, right. I mean, I, I, I measure my water hardness here at my house, and um, it runs between 35 and 40 uh, grains, which is among, uh, I have not found too many other places in the country with this hard of water. And so um, uh, with that um, condition regionally, it's not just Ventura, obviously, but by, I heard earlier that the state water would be only used if there is a drought condition, i.e. locally, where we do not have enough rainwater to um, uh, service our area. So I guess I'm getting a mixed signal about the state water actually being an ongoing uh, a supplemental source to us that would um, soften our water. Is that true? So I can take water. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I can answer that. Sorry if I misspoke. Um, we are using, so what I meant, what I was meaning by that comment is with our other sources going down, our state water is going to be able to come in and really, it's not, it's a supplemental source. It's not an additional source. Right. But we are planning to use around, we don't know what that, so that we're doing a blend. Uh, model right now to see how much water we can bring through depending on how much we get from the state and try to make it so we we give a good water quality constantly. So it will be used constantly is what we're anticipating. Okay, so there would be a steady allotment coming into the Ventura water system. Okay. Correct. Um, um, I'm gonna, you have a lot of great questions that I wanna get to tonight. We have a few more that are coming in for our residents. 
do you mind if are you planning on sticking around for a bit can we address some of the by, by all means just thank you and i'll, I'll stand down circle back to you that sounds fine thank you no problem we'll circle back to you because you have some great questions All right, we are going to, we had a customer and I feel calculator is the um, best tool that's available to us. It says, I just checked my proposed rate increase based on a 10 HCF bill and he's seeing an increase far greater than six to 7%. At what point in the low usage does the six and 7% apply? So Akbar, if you could maybe clarify um, the six and 7% and it seems like we might want to put this customer in touch with our customer care to ensure they're using the bill calculator correctly. Um, but I know there's a little bit of nuance as it relates to the six. Yeah, I, let me, let me, yeah, let me clarify a couple things. Uh, for the for the person asking the question, uh, please keep in mind that the bill calculator uses bi-monthly units. And so if you're typing in 10 and 10 for your bi-monthly water usage and your bi-monthly sewer, you're probably going to end up with those numbers that you uh, quoted there, Haley. Um, please make sure you're using bi-monthly terms. So go back in the bill calculator, put 20 and 20, and what you'll see is a, a much lower increase than uh, what was described. Um, as far as the six and seven percent, uh, when that when that kicks in, uh, the six and seven percent refers to how much revenue the water enterprise and the wastewater enterprise are going to collect overall among all customers. And know that if you, depending on if you're a residential customer uh, using lower uh, amount of water per month, you may see lower increases. Whereas if you're a commercial customer, you're gonna see a different increase. But overall, enterprise wide, utility wide, we're gonna see a 7% increase for water and a 6% increase for wastewater. Thank you, Akbar. Um, we have another good question from one of our residents. Um, do all areas under Ventura's current coverage pay the same rate? So do all of our residents pay the same rate? Um, Akbar, if you want to just go ahead and address that. Sure. A uh, quick answer is today we have a small differential for uh, people outside the city boundaries that we serve in, in the county areas. That's proposed to go away again. It's a small differential that is proposed to be eliminated as part of this rate study. Okay, great. I think we've um, addressed most of those questions. So Al, we're going to circle back to you. Um, I thought you had a really good question. Is there an impartial, oh shoot, I lost it. Um, is there an impartial third party check and balance system in place to monitor the distribution of funds in the water district? And I was actually thinking, um, City Attorney Miles Hogan, if you want to introduce the role of the Water Commission, and then we also have one of our very own Water Commissioners here tonight. So um, after Miles, Suzanne, if you have any. Uh, yes, good evening. Um, and thank you for your great question. Um, yes, the city goes through a long process to review uh, the current rates. So they send, um, all of the current data over to a financial consultant um, who reviews all the data and helps to determine where changes are needed in our rates to make sure that we're complying um, with a law known as Proposition 218 and uh, charging all of our uh, categories of customers uh, fair rates. Um, they go through that process and uh, it, it went uh, through a year before the city's water commission. And I'll turn it over to um, Commissioner McCombs in just a moment to talk about that process. Um, but additionally, in general, uh, the city um, uh, does review its, uh, its financial uh, policies are reviewed every year um, through its budgeting process. And when all the, um, uh, the closing of the uh, uh, books at the end of every fiscal year. So we do go through the general um, financial review policy. So I did want to note that. Um, so I'll turn it over to Commissioner McComb. Thank you for your question. Um, that is one of the priorities that the commission looked at in looking at alternative rate structures was how do we ensure that there's equitable treatment both amongst different customer classes as well as between 
residential users in, in the community as well as the business members. And it's very difficult to balance the, for example, affordability with revenue stability. Um, and yet we prioritized affordability and we felt like the, we, we really tried to address as best we could a rate structure that would be equitable to all residents and members of our business community. And one, one thing question. I do want to add, uh, oh, go ahead, Al. Okay, I guess uh, one follow on to that is, um, you know, earlier we mentioned, or it was mentioned that there are 80, um, and forgive my terminology, uh, subsidized slots currently open right now or low income. Um, I'm curious how many uh, in total, uh, how many totally uh, low income uh, slots exist uh, or are administered by the water district? Because um, where I'm going with this is that I see basically that as a subsidi subsidization for those that can pay their bill, paying for those who can't use, who, who can't pay their bill. And um, from that, I conclude that that minimizes the end user's responsibility to conserve if someone else is gonna pay for their water. So, yeah. um, so I guess that's a question. How many slots are there totally? Um, I don't, I believe there's about 250 slots, but if Miles Hogan, our city attorney would like to speak up, um, he can discuss how we fund those programs and it's not from our water and waste water rate from our customers. So Miles, you wanna elaborate on that? That's a great question. Yes, thank you again for that question. And we do need to make sure, um, as you noted, uh, that one category of customers is not subsidizing another. So for this program, we make sure um, that uh, those discounted rates are paid for from a non ratepayer source of funds. In this case, it's uh, funding from the late fees that are collected um, from other uh, customers that don't pay uh, their bills on time. And so that is a non ratepayer source of funds. Uh, so that's why there is a limited pool of funds generated at this time. Um, the city may in the future explore other ways to generate non ratepayer source, sources of funds in order to expand the program, but that's currently where the funds are paid for to ensure that there isn't um, any subsidy. Great, thank you. That's, that's reassuring, I appreciate that. Of course. You're welcome. Okay. We have addressed um, most of our public comments, questions at this time. I'm gonna allow just, if anybody has any last comments, you can go ahead and shoot them in. Um, we wanna thank everybody who has joined us tonight. Um, as a reminder, we have a lot of information available on our website. It's VenturaWaterRates.net. This is where you'll find that um, bill calculator that we discussed. There are a series of videos, educational videos, and some Q&As, um, frequently asked questions that might address additional questions. Um, additionally, there's some contact information on that website, email address. If there's anything that we didn't address tonight or que outstanding questions that you have after tonight's presentation, there's an email listed on our website and you feel free to send your questions over. Um, we'd love to get those answered. We, again, wanna thank everyone for taking the time. We know that there's so many virtual meetings and opportunities uh, for you to spend your Wednesday evening. And we thank you for joining us tonight to learn more about this really important initiative. And we invite you to please visit our website at VenturaWaterRates.net. And let's see, I think with that, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up tonight. Um, Carlos, I do wanna check in with you just to double check to ensure that we don't have any questions from our Spanish. Okay, perfect. Let's Haley, see, it looks I could, like I have... Oh. Uh, oh, go yeah. ahead, Al, go ahead. We have one more resident who's interested in presenting a question live. So let's take Al your question and then we'll move to Ronald. Um, Ronald, okay. in just a minute, we'll go ahead and promote you. And for those of you um, who would like to stay on, we have plenty of time. Otherwise, we thank you for joining us. So go ahead, Al, and then Ronald will take you next. Okay, I, I promise this will be my last. Um, and I've actually addressed this to the water district 
perhaps even maybe close to a year ago when the My Water portal became available, in that it's my contention that very few people, water consumers here in Ventura, have any clue what an HCF is. And that's what they see on their bill. And when we go to a gas station, we don't buy 0.01 HCF, we buy gallons. And with the um, computer horsepower that we have available these days, it's a simple conversion to turn HCF into gallons. And my reason for bringing this up is that if we make our consuming quantities more understandable on the part of the end user, perhaps there will be more of an effort to uh, conserve in that, oh, my shower just consumed 55 gallons of, of, uh, of, of water, uh, which is more meaningful, I think, to the rank and file than 0.02 HCF. So, um, and I noticed in my portal, that is it calculated in HCF2. And again, that's a simple thing to convert that to gallons. So that's something I'm very focused on conservation as I hope you can tell, but we need to put the tools in the hands of the end users to better understand how much they're using. So thank you very much. And I appreciate uh, letting me speak. Of course, thank you all. That is a great question. And um, we do have exciting news that it sounds like would be of interest to you. We are going to be upgrading our portal um, to your point, that customer portal that customers can go on and see their water usage. And so we will be actually upgrading to a new software system that we believe is going to be more um, user friendly. And we will certainly take your recommendation into consideration as we make that upgrade. So we certainly appreciate that. Um, I do want to give time. We had one other speaker, um, Ronald, who would like to address the um, panel directly. So with that, we'll go ahead and promote you, Ronald, and you feel free to turn on your camera and your um, audio. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? We can. Okay, you. hi. Uh, I have a question or maybe more of a comment regarding the elimination of the wastewater determination period. Uh, I'm a single family household and uh, probably about 65% of my water usage goes on outside, okay? <clears throat> so I used your calculator for the month of J July and August and my wastewater bill went up over 100% because of this month to month calculating wastewater charges. So I feel that's totally unfair. The wastewater charges should be based on wastewater usage. And the best way to do that is the way you were doing it. In fact, the way you were doing it perhaps in 10 years ago, when it was basically January and February, which is of course the rainy season. So people aren't gonna see the large increases in their charges because you, your paper here doesn't really cover, <laughs> it doesn't appear to cover those wastewater charge increases because of the, you're changing the way you're determining the, the rates. And I, I, I think that's just totally unfair. You're, answer before was had something to do with you want to protect a couple some people that have a leak I guess in their pool is that why you're changing to a month to month I think that was Mr. Akbar that addressed that earlier I wouldn't say it is the reason is just an example of somebody who uh, you know would be unfairly penalized the other direction so why are we being all of us being penalized then now I wouldn't characterize it as penalization, sir. I, I would characterize it as uh, making sure that the water that is entering the sewage system is what people are being charged for. And of yeah, course, you can only determine that really in January and February. Correct? Well, I mean, perhaps so. And again, every every home might be different. Your your next door neighbor with a similar size lot uh, may have a very different experience. And yes. Again, they just as an example, artificial turf, as an example, so they never have to pay <laughs> the huge wastewater fees I'm going to be paying because of the watering I do outside. Is that yeah, what, that equitable? 
certainly. And what I was trying to highlight is there are circumstances which we have fielded complaints from of people who may have higher usage during the months of February, March, and April uh, for whatever reason. As in, I mentioned the example of a pool, it could have what been percentage? an example. How many? Yeah, I, I wouldn't yeah. have those metrics for you today, right. but yeah. I'm just saying. You don't have that, right. So you, you're trying to protect a couple people and punishing the rest of us. Is that what's going on here? I think if, 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 if I can chime in, I, I think, uh, Ron, this is a good example of the, um, the difficult balancing we have to do when we look at different approaches to rates. Um, for example, uh, your, your comment, we should measure. Well, the difficulty with measuring um, discharge to the waste system is that's not how houses are metered. And I so get, know, one of the, if, if I can finish, sense. one yes. one of the things we looked at was trying to balance the need to be fair across all residents. And that's why one of the things we instituted with this change in methodology is a cap. Um, and in addition, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Susan, but the cap is set at 12. Correct. Correct. So that covers at this point, Akbar, help me out with the numbers, with the new tier structure, we anticipate that a significant percentage of our residents are going to be within the first two tiers, which would therefore not be using water consumption, which would put them over this cap on the wastewater discharge fee. And so one of the things the commission looked at was trying to come up with a methodology that was easier to understand for all of our customers, but was also equitable. At any rate, 87% would end up in tier one and two collectively. Thank you. Okay. And, and I would offer to you, um, we do customer surveys. We'd be more than happy if you'd like us to, to come out to your um, property and we can help with that to look at maybe there's a leak or um, we do have some uh, irrigation sensors too that might help. So I would offer that up to you if you'd like to take advantage of that. Okay, thank you all for your response to that. And as mentioned, uh oh, did we lose Haley? I think she was doing the wrap up. So um, suffice it to say, uh, I think we uh, answered all the questions that were available tonight. And uh, Haley, it looks like you're back. Do you want to wrap it up? Am I back? Yes. I apologize. Um, I just want to, again, encourage people to visit our website, VenturaWaterRates.net. Um, if you have any outstanding questions or comments that you want us to have, um, there's an email listed there, and we encourage you uh, to provide any feedback. You might think of questions later on that you want to address. Um, and then, again, our next action items will be visiting City Council on May 17th where they will be um, reviewing the recommendation by our water commission and deciding um, to move forward or not with our proposed rate. And we wanna thank everybody for joining us tonight. I know it's been a long night. And so with that, we'll send you off and please reach out to us via email um, at VenturaWaterRates.net. Thank you to all of our panelists and our mayor for joining us tonight and members of the public. Have a great night. <laughs>